Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. When I build an application in Rust, I feel more confident that it will work now and for all time than in any other language. There's not just one reason why I feel like this. Many parts of the language come together to make this feeling concrete. Some of these features are just good practice in other languages, but Rust makes them mandatory. Many of these features appear to be unique to Rust among popular languages. Today I'm going to talk about my observations of how in other languages it's easy to start projects, but in Rust it's easy to finish them. When I choose programming languages, frameworks and ecosystems, I'm looking for one thing these days. I want to be able to finish projects. I want to write a working app quickly enough, correctly enough, and all while responding to the inevitability of change. After I have deployed, I want to know for sure that it does what I want, won't crash under any reasonable circumstances, and is perennial. I, or whoever maintains the project, can come back and change some text in four years, and it'll build fine. We all share this goal of aiming to finish projects. It's why we started building them to begin with. You'll perhaps have heard this. These are the three core pillars of Rust, and they all let me finish projects. Let's talk about the first pillar. Rust is the fastest high-level language on the planet. Look at the source code of this video for my source on that. And due to Rust's zero-cost abstraction principles, modules, generics, iterators, etc. do not cause additional runtime overhead. This means as your application expands, it does not inevitably slow down. This speed is life-changing, or at least paradigm-changing. Compared to a Python app, you require about 72 times less compute resource. You very realistically might not need a complex scaling plan if you write your application in Rust. It's like you've already scaled up 72 times. Multi-region is still probably a good idea for when AWS has what they call an unplanned thermal event. Code you write in Rust is reliable from the start due to the way the language is designed. All the things I've talked about in previous videos come together here. The unsafe system, macros, the rich type system, the cargo build system, and the community focused on correctness. When you program in Rust, more than any other popular language, you can be sure that what you have built works. All the bullshit that we're conditioned to accept from other popular languages mostly just doesn't happen. As an illustration, here is a selection of top Rust crates. Half of these are in the top 10 downloads on crates.io. They have been used millions and millions of times. But look at their last updated dates. They're not abandoned. They're done. This trend in Rust is caused, I believe, by two main forces. Backwards compatibility and correctness. In previous videos, I said there will be no Rust 2.0 due to the macro system. Now, I talked with a Rust maintainer, and they say this actually misses the point. Code written today will be compilable in 5, 10, 40 years because of the Rust team's commitment to perfect backwards compatibility. Code you write today will always compile in all future versions of Rust. The side effect of this is that code you build today benefits from all future optimizations that the Rust toolchain will receive. With no modification by you, your build times and deployed code will get faster. The second big reason Rust code doesn't need modification after it's published is the same reason the learning curve is steeper than for other popular languages. The Rust compiler enforces many things that are just good practice in other languages. A few simple examples of these are no unused variables that you might have forgotten to use, exhaustive pattern matching. In the same vein, Rust will tell you when you've forgotten to handle a match statement exhaustively. This is actually a compiler error, not just a warning. In this example, it's easy to keep all branches in your mind with just two values for a boolean. But when you have modeled the entire valid state of your system with lightweight structs, using match will guarantee at compile time that you and everyone who contributes to your code has not forgotten anything. Correct concurrency. Once you have sent a variable to another thread or channel, it's gone. It is a compiler error to even read it. We call this compiler checked behavior fearless concurrency. You can either quickly tell the compiler that you know the result might be a failure and use unwrap just to get something working now, optionally enriching the crash with an error message with expect, or you can handle the error comprehensively. When writing Rust, unwrap is for prototyping code, so we don't have the annoyance of heavyweight error handling when we just want to get going. This is why most code examples you will see use unwrap. They're not trying to teach you error handling, they're just showing you how to open a file. In other languages, these kinds of runtime pitfalls are hidden, at best by an exception system that you have to catch, or worst, with no visible indication that the code may crash at all. Rust makes it clear. 
if you want to write perfect code, find alternatives to those unwraps. Rust doesn't just give you the tools to write code that doesn't break at runtime, it gives you an escape hatch to write quick code that is clearly signposted as unreliable to anyone auditing the code. This kind of balance of safety and pragmatism leads me to the final pillar of Rust, productivity. This third pillar is where the magic lies, I think. Fast code is fast code, reliable code just works, but productivity is nuanced. Rust respects your time so much. Many popular languages have great productivity. I keep saying popular languages. Let me take a quick detour to address popularity first. Here are the latest Redmonk popularity rankings according to GitHub projects and Stack Overflow tags. For space, I've cut off the top 10. Don't worry, you're not missing anything. It's just the usual suspects, like languages with Java in their name. No matter how theoretically good a language is, if I can't hire a team, can't buy books, can't train myself and others, it's a non-starter. Languages such as Haskell, Elixir, Common Lisp, Julia and others are very exciting and have lots of really great features that I'm excited to learn, but they don't help me with my goal of finishing projects for this reason. Rust slipped into Redmonk's top 20 language rankings in mid-2020, right around the time I started learning Rust. The timing is not a coincidence. Let's get back to productivity. Many popular languages are great for fast prototyping, and Rust is no exception, though you may be surprised to learn this. Fast prototyping is about getting fast or instant feedback. You can do this in a number of ways. I will talk about three. Firstly, you can do this in a language with a REPL or a shell. You can do REPL-driven development by loading data and functions into the runtime and modifying them iteratively based on feedback from multiple experimental executions. If this is a new technique for you, talk to your local data scientist to learn more. Once you have a good idea of what you need, you persist your working code into your source files. The ultimate expression of this is languages where you can save the state of the runtime. Lisps often can do this, for example. Secondly, you can do it in browser, with languages and frameworks that reload source files every page load, or rebuild files when they detect changes. Think React, Ruby on Rails, Django Express, things like that. Make a change, hit F5. Some, like this Clojure framework, even hot load the code into the browser without a reload. Quite a trick. But there's a third way to get feedback. Compiler experimentation. Rust's rich algebraic type system has lifetime annotations. This was designed so that memory can be cleaned up when a variable falls out of scope. But it also gives you superpowers. Superpowers I will have to explain in detail in a dedicated video. The short version is that if your type system has lifetime annotations, you can describe not just what your data is, but when. Let's see an example of compiler feedback. Remember this Boolean match error from earlier? This is an example of the conversation you can have with the compiler as you work. You try something, and it might need tweaking to be safe or complete, but the compiler very often tells you exactly what to do to fix it. It feels a lot like test-driven development, red, green, refactor, but the tests have already been partially written for you. In previous videos, I likened it to a driving instructor, gently guiding you how to navigate the dangerous highway. It's not just possible to write perfect safe code with Rust. It's actually easy. Let me finish with a real-life analogy of what it feels like to me to deploy Rust. This is the Royal Albert Bridge, the final rail link between London and Penzance, opened in 1859. It's so old that it predates cars. It was designed by the original hipster Isambard Kingdom Brunel, planned carefully, built to specification, and now it is solid infrastructure and is gently, safely rusting. It brought my father to London in the 60s, and just a few weekends ago, I used it to make another return journey to visit him. There's an ugly 70s concrete road bridge next to it these days. But I know which one will probably still be standing in another 161 years. With Rust, when your code compiles, check it in. You're done. And can finally finish your projects and go outside and play. If you'd like to see what you can write in Rust, click the top video. I used it to make a fun retro computer visualization for my sci-fi and mental health podcast, Lost Terminal. And if you'd like to watch more of my fast technical videos, click the bottom video. Transcripts and markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned comment. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.